Finally, I get to do some math on my channel. What, not that math? Alright, we'll do pixel math and PixInsight. Welcome to SETI Astro. Not 100% sure why so many people are shied away from pixel math. Maybe it's just the math involved, but I am kind of a math nerd. I even have a pie earring. Um, so, let's cover pixel math. We can go through some basics, what I use it for, uh, which ends up being a, a lot of little things, and some more specific examples. I'm sure a lot of you have a couple predefined process already for pixel math, maybe screening stars or a stretch, but may not actually dive into the equations much. I think the first thing to realize is what our images actually contain as far as values. In our images, the values actually range from zero to one. So in pixel math, the math acts a little different than how you normally would think about it because those values are constrained to zero and one. For instance, multiplying two images together will always yield a darker image since multiplying any two numbers that are less than one together will get an even smaller number. Conversely, taking something like the square root is going to actually give you a bigger value. And then anything outside the range at the end will be clipped to zero or one. I think it important we just cover some basics with pixel math itself. You have a means of making a single expression uh, and you can actually have lots of equations within here. Or you can uncheck the single expression and do individual RGB expressions. There is a symbols tab. If you want to load in uh, symbols, like maybe you want the scale to be 0.5 or 0.3 or what, whatever the case may be, or your, your target black point, you want to have it be uh, 5% or, or you know it's just a place for defining symbols and then there's also the expression editor where it has all your has all the different functions and operators as well as your images off to the right so you could double click these to insert them in your equations it may be useful especially if you have a bunch of images open and you don't remember the names of them all um, so that, that could be very helpful, along with there are nice descriptions of all the different functions off to the right here too, if you're unfamiliar with one of the functions or expressions that you may have downloaded or you want to use, they're, they're in there. The destination is fairly important. Usually you just are either replacing the target image or creating a new one. You're allowed to change the image ID or leave it as auto. And then very importantly, if you're going from a grayscale image and you want it to be in a color space, you have to do RGB color. So if you're loading in RGB images in here to make a color composite of something and they're all grayscale, be sure you're selecting the right color space down in here. Okay, let's look at something that I think everybody's familiar with adding. Normally adding's just adding, but in PixInsight, one plus one equals one. It's it's clipped to one, so you can't go above that. That's why there's all these methods of putting our stars back in our images. If you naively just add, there's a good chance you're going to clip a bunch of data. So the two methods that are really utilized is to either stretch it the histogram all the way back to the left almost like it's linear then add them together and then stretch it back or screening stars so let's just go ahead and do that naive addition here's uh, my image zoomed in on Andromeda and I have uh, the stars right behind it and you can see some of these areas are already quite bright in the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range, and the stars themselves obviously are going to be bright, you know, in the upper 
0.6 to 0.9 range uh, themselves. So I have pixel math open in the expression editor. Uh, I have it just as a single expression and I just want to add the one image to the other. Uh, so let's just do that addition. There we go. And as you can see, all these stars look ugly. They're all blown up. They're all clipped to one. One, 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 all the way across the board. Even on some of these dimmer, dimmer stars, they're just uh, completely blown out. Uh, even here, all clipped to one. So we don't want to do that. If we're talking about pixel math, you're getting math. Uh, and you're getting a PowerPoint. So here we are in everybody's favorite PowerPoint for a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. Let's look at screening those stars in versus just adding them. What does that do? You've probably seen two equations for screening stars in. One with these tilde symbols and the other just with normal adding and subtracting. But they are equivalent and I just want to show that the math in here does work like every other math in any other realm of the universe. Um, it's just a matter of breaking down what these equations are trying to do for our image, understanding that, and utilizing it for our benefit to enhance our images. So the first one, we'll just call the images A and B. It's important to note that that tilde means inverse but that's not a one over x situation. Again, we're confined between zero and one. So that means that it's really just one minus our image value. So every place that there's that little tilde symbol, you could just put one minus that image in there. And you gotta use, you gotta use your math. And you use, uh, everybody's heard of foil back in your school days. Uh, the first, the outers, the inners, the lasts to multiply out those parentheses, right? And then when you get through that, there's that final one minus, which flips all the signs in between the parentheses, and then you're left with the, the one minus one, which is zero. And then it's A and B minus A times B. So that's really what's going on between those two equations. It's the same exact thing. In our practical case about trying to get the stars back into the image, it ensures that we never go over one. So we're adding the star values, we're adding the image value, and then we're subtracting the multiplicative of the two. Worst case, we have pixels that are both white clipped in our image and white clipped in our stars, which would be a one. So then you'd have one plus one, which is two, Pixel math does allow values in its equations as it's working through them to be outside the zero to one range. It's just when it generates the image, it will clip it to one. So we have one plus one is two minus one times one, which is one. So that whole thing still ends up being one. So the maximum our screening function can be is our maximum range of one. It ensures that we aren't clipping data when we go ahead and screen our stars back in. That is not true for the methods that use something like a median transfer function and reduce the brightness of our two images, the stars and the image. Do a traditional addition and then restretch it up to the nonlinear or pseudo nonlinear or nonlinear phase. When you do that addition, just a raw addition in PixInsight, there is a chance that you will clip data. So it's important on everybody just understanding that. For linear data, most of the data is smashed to the left of the histogram. So adding isn't going to hurt the signal. It's only gonna affect the very brightest stars in your image. But screening itself, mathematically, will never clip your data. So again, we can look at the difference. Here's our raw addition with the very blown out stars and then applying one of the two screen star formulas in pixel math gives 
much more natural looking stars with nothing actually clipped back to one. And a little bit even of a closer view, here's just the raw edition again and the screen stars. One last item about adding stars back in. Let's say there's an area of your image you don't want the stars to be as prominent in. A great way to do that is to use something like mask range selection or the game script to identify that region. Okay, here's the region that I don't want the stars to be as prominent within the galaxy itself. So if you invert the image, uh, control I can invert the image. We'll open up pixel math. We'll use the expression editor just to find that range mask. There it is. And we want not completely masked out. We do want stars in there, but maybe you'd want the stars only half as bright. So let's go ahead and just add 0.5. Now what that did was replace all those zeros with 0.5, it just add them. The outside's still just one, it clips it to one. And we can go ahead and apply that mask now to our main image. You can see that spot is masked, but only at half the value. So now if we can now if we go in and run our screen stars. We have to replace the image because masks only work in pixel math if you replace the target image. And there you go. So the stars are just as bright as they normally would be outside the galaxy. But then within that masked area, they're only half as powerful as they should be. And again, back to uh, normal brightness on the far side. So that's using masks within pixel math to even be selective of how you put your stars back into your images. Another thing we may want to use pixel math for is to boost our signal. Uh, especially in narrow band images, you may have hydrogen and oxygen in some combination and you just want to boost the, the hydrogen in your image. The problem with just straight up multiplying a channel in pixel math is it would multiply all the values in the image, all the noise at the bottom and the signal at the top. What we really want to do is just increase the signal above the noise so we don't actually increase the noise as well. So really what we want to do is we want to subtract the noise from our image, then multiply the signal out, then add the noise back in because that is going to keep it normalized to the other channels in our image. And a way to do that is, is listed up here. Again, let's just step through what the function is telling us. We're going to take our target image we're going to subtract the median value of our target image. So that's what this is encapsulating here. Pretty much everything less than the median is just going to be the background. Then we're going to go ahead and we're just, in this example, multiplying it by 2. Multiplying that signal by 2. And then we're going to go ahead and add that median back in to keep it normalized to the other channels. So again, it, these things may look intimidating with all the dollar signs and parentheses and stuff, but think about the flow of what it wants to do to your image and what you want to have done to your image. We have our before and we want to get to our after, and how do we step through that mathematically? to get to our end result. So again, just as an example, 
here's hydrogen data in Andromeda. The, the background's way out over here to the right. It's about 0.2-ish. And we can go ahead and just apply that formula in pixel math. We want to replace this target image in this case. Now it brightened up the galaxy substantially. But the, uh, the background out here is still roughly uh, that same 0.2 it was beforehand. So again, it's really important to think about what our equation is trying to do for us and what we want it to do for our image. If anybody's seen my video on continuum subtraction, you'll have noticed a, a pixel math process in there to extract the narrowband data. So here's my uh, image, it's hydrogen in the red channel, and then in the green and blue channels, I put my red broadband channel in there. And what we want to do is take out all that red signal, which is the pure hydrogen signal, out of the broadband. So what that equation is actually doing, if you look, inside here is our, is almost like our signal equation before from when we were talking about boosting the signal. That little bracket one means it's looking at the green channel. Bracket zero is the red channel. If there was a bracket two, it'd be the blue channel. So it's taking the green channel minus the median of the green channel. So we're left with just the signal in the green channel. And then what we want to do is take the red channel minus the signal from the green channel. So all that we're going to be left with is any additional signal in the red channel. So all this red will be in there along with the median background. And running that, everybody that's uh, utilized that process that I've walked through is very familiar with an, an image that looks like this, that there's still the median background along with all our signal that we would uh, like to keep in our narrowband continuum subtract data. Now let's go ahead and use pixel math to really open your eyes and see what data you may possibly have been losing during your your weighted batch pre-processing. Here is my calibrated image of one of my hydrogen sub-exposures. It is dark subtracted and flat field corrected. No cosmetic correction done, it's just a calibrated image. So if you have not been putting pedestal values in for your narrow band images, this should show you why you need to do this. Let's go ahead and tell PixInsight that we want to see every pixel that is clipped to zero. This would mean during the calibration process, it had a negative value at some point and it just clipped it to zero. Wow. So on the red channel, we just want the target image still. The green channel, we want to go say, ahead and say, if the target value equals zero, then go ahead and make it a one. Otherwise, just display the target value. What that's going to do is, if it is clipped to zero, it'll make it a bright green dot for us to see. And then on the blue channel, we could just tell it to go ahead and be the target image. We want to create a new channel. We want to create a new image. And we want the color space to be an RGB image. So let's go ahead and do that. And here we go. That is a lot of black zeros within the image. And we could actually quantify exactly how many it clipped. Again, let's go ahead and use pixel math 
and let's just see now all those dots. All right, let's quantify how many were actually clipped to zero. All we need is the Boolean operator here. It's just a true or false statement. Is the target value greater than zero? That's all we're gonna tell Pixel Math to do. So it's going to output a one if that's true. So if it's bigger than zero, it's gonna give us a nice one, which is white. Or if it's exactly zero, it'll be false and it'll give us a nice zero or a black point. So let's go ahead and just run that. Okay, here's our image now. Dot it with all our actual clipped black points. And if we open up histogram transformation, we'll hit the little checkbox to track our view to the image here. And if we slide the black point just off the left, it'll tell us now, right down in here, that there were actually 135,000 black dots on that image, or just under 1%. So roughly, I lost 1% of this image data during calibration and WBPP. To avoid that, we need to utilize the pedestal setting and give it some value. What that's going to do is during the stacking process, it's going to add a small amount of value at the very bottom, do the calibration such that if something does dip below zero, it will have added, it, it raised it up on the pedestal. So it's always in the positive territory. So let's go ahead and do a similar experiment now where I had a pedestal setting of 400. And we'll go ahead and do the same pixel math where we're just gonna say, hey, if it's, if it's greater than zero, make it white. And again, we can go ahead and track this view here. And now this is saying that there are 67,000 pixels that were clipped or about, or about a half a percent. So we went from about a percent down to a half percent lost data and actually that's probably acceptable when it's getting that low now that is most likely just uh noise way at the bottom but we can go ahead and we'll go ahead and then do a pedestal of 800 we'll run that same pixel math if it's greater than zero that's all that's all it is and now there are very few of these black dots in here and again, running histogram transformation and just pulling the left black point off the bottom, we could see that there was only 2,600 black points in the entire image. And 800 may sound like a lot for a pedestal, but remember, it's using 32-bit numbers, so there's 65,000 values possible. So you adding six or eight hundred at the bottom isn't going to actually affect your image pretty much at all but it could save a percent of your image especially if you are at a very dark site or you have a very narrow band filter like a three nanometer filter that may actually save some data for you at the very low ends if you're really trying to capture those those faint wisps, or you just don't want to throw away data for no reason. If you don't know where the pedestal setting is, be sure to select your narrowband filter, and it's under the calibration tab. It's right in the middle where it says output pedestal setting. Put that to something. 500, 600, 700 for any of your narrowband filters. For your RGB filters, there's plenty of light signal during dark subtraction and flat field correction. Uh, you will almost never ever dip into the negative territory where it will be clipped to zero. But for your narrowband filters, I encourage you to run this little exercise. Take one of your calibrated frames, go into pixel math, 
and tell it to just at target greater than zero, create a new image, and then use your histogram transformation. Click the little check, pull the black point off the left there, and see how many pixels you've actually been throwing away, uh, which is potential signal. Another thing you may want to investigate is differences between how uh, an image is processed if you do one method versus another method and you could use pixel math to determine that too so let's walk through an example where i am going to see the difference between the gradient correction process and graxpert so we'll go ahead and run gradient correction on one and then we're going to go ahead and run Graxpert on the other. Now you want to see what the difference is between these two images. You need to utilize pixel math for that. Again a word of caution because you are constrained to zero to one just doing a straight subtraction will lead to clipping, right? If, some, if one's bigger than the other or vice versa and you do that subtraction, you can lead to negative numbers. So an easy way to do that is just one minus the other, but we need to add in something so we don't go into that negative. So the best way to do that is using the median value again of one of the images. And we'll just say it's it's a new image. And we can run a screen stretch on it. And that's the difference between what uh, Graxpert did and gradient correction. So everything that is uh, brighter is going to be brighter in the Graxpert image. Everything that's dark um, was darker, right? But it's just a, a good way you could actually make comparisons between how you process it one way versus another. And you can see that there, there's, there's differences. There's some structure over here. There's some blobs in the middle. Uh, is that signal? Is that background? Is that gradient? Uh, we'll leave it up to the viewer as an exercise. Last thing I want to talk about is using two different palettes and a single image and how pixel math can do that for us. So let's say you have an image and it has two different objects in it and you really like the palette look on one object but you really like a different palette look on another object. So let's go ahead and uh, utilize a mask and pixel math and make that happen for us. First thing to do is mask the thing we want to change. So uh, I'll just make an arbitrary choice. We want to change this particular nebula up here into the lower palette. So I'm going to go ahead and use the game script to accomplish that. I'm going to go ahead and add just a big ellipse over here till it okay here's our mask now we don't want the transition to be sharp like that so let's go ahead and just use convolution to soften that edge somewhat all right there's our mask we can apply it to our image so this is the area we want to change so now let's go ahead and pull up pixel math And we really just want to replace this up here with the the one below it. So we just tell Pixel Math, hey, just reshow me the just reshow me that image. So I'm just typing in image 57. I want to replace it because replacing works with masks. And I'm just gonna go ahead and drop it on our masked target image and there we go.
it's done. So here's our nice image now. With two different palettes in it. And you could do that. Maybe you want, uh, maybe there's a little bubble off to the one side. You want a good HOO palette. Maybe the rest of the nebula, you had a lot of sulfur in it. So you really wanted a great Hubble palette with it. Whatever the case may be, but you could definitely use Pixel Math to give you these bi palette images. And there's a lot that you could do as well with using the image itself brighter points, dimmer points uh, to adjust the palettes throughout and that's where you really get into 4x palettes. But uh, I think this is just a great example of how we could have one object in one palette, one object in another palette, and using pixel math for that. If you've stuck around this long, you're one of the, the true, true math nerds out there like me and I really appreciate it. Please comment and any suggestions you have down and below. Please like and subscribe.